Well, good morning, everybody. We have a great looking crowd here today, and I hope you're here to praise and worship our Lord together. So let's stand together and join our voice in praise as we sing to the Lord. To God be the glory. Let's sing. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And opened the light gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh God, to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Give our Lord a praise this morning. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I hope you can echo that. Great things he hath done, right? Amen. For us personally, for us as a, a church family, great things he has done. Well, I want to welcome you this morning to Eastside Baptist Church. For those of you that are here with us this morning, welcome. What a privilege and what a treat to see you here. If you're visiting with us here this morning, welcome. We do not take it for granted, and we count it a real joy and a privilege to have you here with us. You've chosen to come and worship, and we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. To those of you that are joining us this morning on Facebook Live, welcome. What a treat to have you join us too, and it's a privilege to have you be with us for our worship and Bible study time this morning. And if you're a guest at Eastside Online on Facebook Live this morning, welcome to you too. We count it a privilege. A lot of things you can be doing online, I know. Uh, Sudoku and other kind of games. Uh, I do that in my office here through the week, so I know about things like that. A lot of things you can be doing online, but you've chosen to be with us this morning. What a real privilege. And so if you're joining us, whether it's here on Facebook Live, welcome. We are glad to have you here at Eastside Baptist Church. Now before we pray and begin our service, I need to give two quick words of thanks. First, to my church family. Uh, didn't get a chance to say anything at the end of the service last week, but I just want to say thank you for the gifts, the cards, the notes that were presented to both Bill and myself last Sunday for Pastor Appreciation Sunday. I'm not sure any pastor could feel more appreciated than the one standing behind this pulpit. And I am so grateful for my church family. Thank you. Second thanks to those of you that came last night for trunk or treat or participated in any capacity. Thank you. Um, I am so grateful for a church that, that has a heart to serve and so grateful we were able to partner with uh, First Baptist of Mariana and we had, I'm not sure how many cars, at last count somewhere between 20 and 25 cars that had trunks open or hatchbacks open or truck beds lowered and all kinds of decorations and oh my soul. Candy and candy and candy. This event was supposed to last from five to seven. And cars were already lining up at about 4.30. And at about 10 till five, Bill came around and said, we're gonna go ahead and start letting some cars come in because they're almost to uh, 90. And we were like, okay, go ahead. And by 10 after five, you could look and see car lights up 90 past the Oaks, waiting to, to, to come in. And I forget at what time it was, but the police sent somebody and said, we have got to clear Highway 90. Can we reroute folks? And so we had folks going back here to Turner's Landing in a line. And still it came out to 90 almost. Some folks waited an hour and 40 minutes in line just to pass through. And I was, I, literally, I was blown away. And I don't know how many folks thanked us for having something for them and their kids as they, they went through. And so I'm so grateful for my church family and your heart to, to serve and minister to our community and what you did last night. <laughs> And when, I was told around seven-ish when it was supposed to end, uh, our, our, our flag men and flashlight guys did the best they could to cut things off at that point. And still, it was 8.30 before we left because the cars that were already in line after they cut things off at, at uh, seven o'clock still to get through. Uh, we, we wanted to try to give out candy. We got to the end and I, I was throwing candy at, ki at, at kids. Thanks for coming. Je yes, sir, Mr. Pete. Wow. 
We turned away, did you hear that? Probably 30 or 40 cars uh, in, in the midst of all that. And so to my church family, thank you for those that came and set up. Thank you for Amber. She was kind of the uh, point person, Amber Tucker. Thank you for taking the lead and kind of getting things going. Some of you couldn't be here, but you brought candy. Thank you. I enjoyed some of your chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you got to keep your energy up while you're serving others, right? And so anyway, uh, thank you so much for, for that. Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, open with a word of prayer. And many of you know our church has many ministries and has the opportunity to do different things. One of those was last night. Uh, we have aided many dentists in our county. <laughs> And so there's a ministry there, but we have it seriously. We have a ministry called Operation Christmas Child. And some of you know that we have a group that takes that, is energized about that, serves in that capacity. And over the past couple of years, our church has sent uh, roughly 2,400 boxes each year. Am I close with that? That's our goal this year. Well, didn't we send 22 or 2,400 last year? 3,000. Pastorally speaking, we sent 4,500 boxes uh, last year to children all around the world. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is a really great ministry, and I'm so glad our church has the opportunity to participate in that. But after I pray, uh, Dennis Everett's going to come. I think there's going to be a video to just give you kind of an update, let you know about some things as we prepare to send out another, Lord willing, 2,400 boxes this year from my church. So let me pray and then Dennis, uh, you come on. Or is the video gonna go first? The video, okay, I'll pray, we'll get the video and then Dennis will share. Would you join me as we pray? God, as we begin this morning, man, what, what a way to begin worship with a reminder in song. Great things you have done. Thank you for that. And because of that, man, Lord, you're worthy of our praise and our adoration and our honor. But the reality is, Lord, even if you hadn't done anything, you're still worthy of our praise and our adoration and our honor. And so this morning, our Father, we worship you. This morning, our Father, we give you praise. This morning, our Father, we thank you. Thank you for lives that were touched last night. Thank you for lives that will be touched through shoe boxes that go to kids in various places around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to sing and fellowship and study your word. Thank you. God, you really are worthy of honor. We give that to you. You're worthy of praise. We give that to you. And you're worthy of worship. And we give that to you. Meet with us today and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three, two, At the count of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they are so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. And that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Good morning, church. So obviously November is upon us. And you know what that means. It's time to get some of those Operation Christmas Child boxes out the door. 
I know you've heard it all before, but packing a shoebox for OCC is not just about giving a child a toy, a pair of socks, a toothbrush, or a comb. The real goal here, the real goal, is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with children all around the world. Since 1993, OCC has collected and delivered more than 178 million shoebox gifts to children in more than 160 countries and territories. Before the children receive their shoebox, you may have seen on the video, they hear the gospel. To reinforce what they hear, each shoebox gift also contains a storybook entitled The Greatest Gift. Now this storybook is a, a book that shares the message of salvation with them. So far, the storybook has been translated into 60 languages. Now obviously, some of the children you saw are probably too young to read. So it's just very important that uh, part of the OCC mission is to train local Christians to help disciple the children, and in some cases, read the storybook to them. By reading the storybook, obviously, they're, they're given the first introduction to the love of Jesus. More than 75,000 shoebox outreach events take place every year. Now, as I was sitting in my chair at home last night and, and I read that statistic, it really hit home with me. Now, these are not 75,000 kids. These are 75,000 shoebox outreach events. 30 kids, 50 kids, 100 kids. I'm sure it varies along the way. To put it in context, what if the United States had 75,000 revivals a year? that had 30 or 40 or 50 people. Imagine the impact that we could have on the United States of America by introducing the lost to Jesus Christ. But the exposure to the gospel doesn't stop with the shoebox. It doesn't stop with the discipleship shortly thereafter, reading the book to them. Since 2009, more than 23 million children who received a shoebox gift have gone one step further and participated in a program called The Greatest Journey. It's a 12-lesson discipleship program. Children learn from trained local volunteers what it means to follow Jesus and how to share their faith with friends and family. So how can you help? Well, there's a number of things. First, obviously it takes money to get these boxes to their, de to their destination. Um, OCC asks us to send a $9 donation per shoe box to help defer expenses. Now, you heard Dr. Bai say earlier that... Um, we're going to do 2,400 shoeboxes this year, and if you do the math, that's uh, over, that's about $21,000 that's going to be needed for shipping costs. But the money is used for more than just shipping. There's obviously the literature cost that we've already talked about. There's the training cost for the local Christians that we've already talked about, and there's processing costs. Joanne and I were blessed last year to be able to go to the Atlanta Processing Center where the shoe boxes are examined for inappropriate items. Um, they're scanned so that they know where the boxes are going. Uh, yes, there's even a drug sniffing dog that as the um, cartons come off of the, of the trailers, um, to make sure that there's nothing in there because there's nothing that's gonna kill a ministry like a, a drug bust, right? Uh, all of these things cost money. As I looked around at this huge, huge warehouse, there were hundreds and hundreds of volunteers there. There were paid people. That money's got to come from someplace. You've got to keep the electricity on. You've got to keep the water running. You've got to pay the rental on the processing um, facility. So all of this takes, takes money. I went to a, a regional meeting with Joanne a few weeks ago, and Ms. Vivian, the regional coordinator, said just for funny ha-has, if you will, she packed a box and shipped it on her own. It cost her well over $30 to send the box. So really $9 for shipping, $9 for processing is really not that much. What else can you do? You can pack your own box. Empty shoe boxes are available out in the, out in the lobby. You can see my wife, Joanne, after the service to get one or two or 10, if that's the way you want to do it. Now Joanne has spent literally hundreds and hundreds of hours this year. She and many volunteers have spent hundreds of hours getting the, the things together for these shoe boxes. But yet, she and I still pack an individual shoe box. It's a personal thing that you can do. 
Um, it's an opportunity to, to, to share personal love with the child. And for me, I'm a visual guy. I like to visualize what's going to happen when that child opens that box and sees that soccer ball or sees that flashlight. You saw the smiles on the kids' faces in the video. There's nothing in the world that warms my heart and makes me smile like the smile of a child. And to think, they're also going to get the opportunity to know Jesus, where I might get to see them myself. And hopefully, not for 30 or 40 years from now, but who knows, might be tomorrow. Maybe I'll get to see them. <clears throat> now, there's another opportunity there if you pack your own shoebox. You can actually pay a little extra money and you can have your box tracked and they will send you a receipt showing you where your box went in the last few years. Joanne and my boxes, they've uh, ended up in countries like Chad and Mali and Angola. And it gives me a, like I said before, just a, a tremendous joy to think of the joy that, that's going to be given to a child just because of a shoebox. What else? Um, once again, Eastside is serving as the local collections point for shoeboxes that are put together by other churches. We'll start receiving shoeboxes the third week of November. I believe it's November 16th through the 23rd, if I'm remembering correctly. There is a sign-up sheet out at the welcome desk. Um, if you can work, volunteer an hour or two or three, I think it's, how many hours is it per day, Joanne? It's like two hours a day during the week and on Saturdays and Sundays it might be four hours. If you can work an hour, great. If you can work four hours, that's great too. But the sign-up sheet is out there and it's very important that we get these shoe boxes, collect them here, and then we'll take them over to Chipley to Shiloh where they'll be put together and shipped to the processing center. In addition, um, well, you've already heard me say there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on year round at Eastside Baptist Church getting these boxes to, together. Joanne and several volunteers meet every Thursday from 10 to 2 upstairs where they sort items, fold shoe boxes, put labels on boxes, pack shoe boxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they can always use some help there. So if you can help with that, that would be great. Um, there is a I'll call it a fundraising event, if you will. Anna Stevens, you've heard Bill Stevens talk over the last few Sundays how his wife is taking Christmas pictures over in the uh, children's wing. Um, Anna did this for OCC shipping costs. Last year for $20, you get uh, two to three digital images. You get either one eight by 10 or two five by sevens. Uh, we used the digital images ourselves last year to put together a Christmas card that we sent out and it, it worked out really well. Anna is quite a talented photographer. And it's not just the photography, she's gotten to be a master of the editing software. So if you've got some blemishes, you want to lose a few pounds in the photo, she can help you out. <clears throat> Obviously, some things would require a miracle, but anyway. <laughs> now, many of you have participated in the silent auction that ended yesterday. If you were the high bidder on an item, you can pick it up after church and be sure to make your checks payable to Eastside Baptist Church. Be sure to specify uh, OCC shipping on the check. And thanks to everyone who provided a craft and thanks to everyone who placed a bid. If you need help or need um, ask any questions about that, please see Joanne after the service. Um, as you heard Dr. Bice say, this year's goal is 2,400 shoe boxes. 1,800 of those boxes have already been packed, so there's 600 more to go. In order to give everyone a chance to participate, two shoebox packing parties are going to be held here at the church. The first one is scheduled for tonight at 6 o'clock. It won't be in here like we've done in the past. It's going to be upstairs, closer to where all of the goods are. Um, I think there will be some uh, procedures that have changed in view of the pandemic and all that uh, to make it a little bit safer. So if you can be here at 6 o'clock tonight, we're going to pack 300 boxes tonight. And then a week from tonight, 6 o'clock next Sunday, there will be 300 more boxes, and that will complete the 2,400 boxes. And last but not least, finally, you can pray for the kids who are going to receive the shoe boxes. Pray that their hearts and minds will be receptive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Pray that the pandemic will not impede the processes required to get them to where they need to be. And pray that the right box will make it to the right child. Uh, I remember a story that we were told, one shoe box, basically all it had in it was a blanket. 
we as Americans are thinking, oh, that's not sufficient. Let's see if we can't stuff something else in there. But when it reached the child, the child was super excited. Why were they excited? They'd never owned their own blanket. God got the blanket where it was supposed to go. So be sure that you pray that the box, the right box, will make it to the right child. I want to thank the church. This church has been super supportive of OCC in the past. We thank you for everything that you do. You're a kind and loving and giving church, and we appreciate all the help and support that you have given. And most of all, we thank you for helping to spread the love of Jesus. God bless. Amen. We are so blessed here at Eastside to be such a missions-minded church. Everything we do here and so many ministries are to reach out to our community and even to the world. And programs like Operation uh, Christmas Child, like even last night at the Trunk or Treat, it's all about the gospel. And it's all about spreading the gospel. It's all about John 3.16. Amen. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what this song we're about to sing talks about. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness. Find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in Him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your
focus on the Lord as he prepares us for what he has for us today. Sing it with us. Lord, stand and sing it with us. Sydney has a special song for us today, and uh, just pray you'd open your hearts to what God has to say to you through this song.
Thank you, Sydney. What a good reminder. Satisfied in the goodness of Jesus. Wow. Whoops, sorry about that. We, uh, while she was singing, I couldn't help but, but think about a couple of passages uh, kept running through my mind. One's in the Old Testament where it talks about the, the uh, goodness of, the nearness of God is our good and then I was had running through my mind Philippians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul talks about all those things that used to bring him satisfaction. And if you go back and read Philippians chapter 3, he talks about his heritage and his lineage and his religion and all those things and that he used to find joy in and used to find worth in. And he comes down. And he says, as you're reading through uh, Philippians chapter 3, but none of them could compare to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus. Man, what a passage. And boy, what a song. Thank you, Sydney. Well, this morning, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and find the New Testament book of Acts. And once you find Acts, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And as we study together this morning, we continue our journey with the early disciples, our journey with the early followers, followers of the Lord Jesus. And we continue to think about one question, that one question we keep asking consistently week after week after week. And that one question is what? When's he going to finish? <laughs> Tell me the question you asked before we get that far along in the message. What? happened next what happened next and we keep seeing history unfold before our eyes early church history man the the early followers of of jesus and their lives how they were impacted and how they were changed by the resurrection their early lives and ministry and how they were impacted after jesus was ascended and went to heaven and god's spirit fell and how their lives were impacted and changed as they begin to to minister and and walk in the power of God's spirit that had come upon them. And thinking about their lives and, and their ministry and ministries and just things that were taking place as they encountered things day by day in their walk with the Lord. 
And you guys know recently now, as we've studied together, we've been in a section of the book of Acts that we have called trans, uh, uh, transitional, right? I mean, we're thinking about the, the way is being paved in Acts chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12 for the gospel to go where? From, from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. It's not made it there yet. I mean, that was Jesus' promise to his followers going all the way back to the very first chapter. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus told his followers what now? When God's Spirit comes, they shall be his what? Witnesses. Yeah, they shall be his witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so that's where the gospel is moving. And that's what is happening. That's what we see unfolding before our eyes. And so in this transitional uh, set of chapters, we have discovered a couple of things. A couple of truths have been made very apparent to us. And that's this. For the gospel to continue to spread, a couple of things have to be true, don't they? One, barriers have to be broken and boundaries have to be crossed, right? For the gospel to get out of Jerusalem, some barriers had to be broken and some boundaries had to be crossed. How was the gospel going to get out of Jerusalem if somebody didn't step outside the city limits? <laughs> Somebody had to be the first to cross a barrier. Somebody had to be the first to, to, to go over a boundary line. And then how was the gospel going to get at, to Judea and Samaria? Barriers had to be broken. Boundaries had to be crossed. And so we're seeing some of that take place in these chapters. We're seeing some of those events, those foundational events that... that that set the stage for the gospel going now to places all over the world. And I want you to know I've been reminded, I've shared with you week after week now how our study of the book of Acts continues to, to even challenge me and to, to cause me to think about uh, myself personally, certainly, but, but us as a church. And us thinking about what it would take to be an Acts 1-8 church. I mean, what are we doing to reach our Jerusalem? Well, some of, uh, we're giving candy to people all over the place. <laughs> I mean, that's a part of ministry to help reach our Jerusalem. But what are we doing to get outside of our Jerusalem to our Judea? Where's our Samaria and what in the world are we doing there? What about the ends of the earth? What are we doing there? And I've shared with you kind of my heart thinking about developing a missions team that would help us have an Acts 1-8 focus for our church. And having folks that have a heart to see our church be active in reaching our Jerusalem. And having folks that would, have, uh, that would help us and have a heart to lead our church to reach our Judea and our Samaria and the ends of the earth. And we would develop and have that kind of team that would meet. And they would pray and they would plan. And they would help us have events every year. Where we would be doing what we could be doing to fulfill Acts 1-8 in our church. We'd be an Acts 1-8 church. But to do some of those things, part of what we've discovered, beside the fact that barriers have to be broken, besides the fact that boundaries have to be crossed, we've talked about the fact that some other things have to take place, don't they? And I brought up two weeks ago a very bad word in Baptist circles. Change. You were seated, weren't you? Some things have to change. We, we, we saw that. That was part of our, 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 our study last week in Acts chapter 11. Some things had to change for the, disi the disciples, the followers of Jesus, had to come to a point where they saw things differently. And so we discussed the fact that in times of transition, part of what takes place is that our minds have to be changed to do what they need to do to get to the next step, to get to the next phase. 
That's part of how the Lord uses times of transition in our lives. And it forces us to think about things that maybe we hadn't thought about before. Now let me give you a real example. It's just us in here this morning, isn't it? Many of you, since I've been the pastor here, have said to me, Pastor, we need to see younger families come into this church. And how many of you would agree with that? How many of you still think I am a younger family? <laughs> hey, I, I get that. I agree with that. Absolutely. But now here's a question. Are you willing to do what it would take for that to happen? Or are we just going to keep doing the same thing we've been doing and hope? Somebody describes that as insanity, right? Keep doing the same thing you've been doing and expect different results? God help us. I mean, if we're really going to be intentional about doing what it would take to reach younger families, are we willing to do what it takes to do that? Or are we just going to keep, what we're do keep doing what we're doing and just hope that that'll happen? I mean, these are questions I, I think about during the week when I'm playing Sudoku <laughs> in the office. Changed. Are we willing? I mean, that, that's what's going on in the lives of the early followers of Jesus at this point in Acts chapter 11. They are wrestling with change. What change? Can somebody hear the gospel? They are having to come to terms with the fact that a Gentile? Oh, my soul. They can be saved? A Gentile can be saved? They're having to have a whole mindset change to think about what it would take for the gospel to get to the Gentiles. And change had to occur in their practice and in their thinking for the gospel to get to where it needed to go. And those two things always go together. A change of mind eventually is going to work itself out in your practice. Or it's really not a change of mind, it's just a passing thought you've had, right? Right? And trying to think through what the early followers of Jesus are wrestling with. But they're making the right decisions. God's Spirit is encouraging them and teaching them. Even Peter, hard-headed Peter, eventually got the vision after he saw it three times. And he got the idea. Oh, that's what God wants. <laughs> that's what God was trying to teach me. The issue wasn't food, it was people. And so now when we come to the passage we're going to be looking at this morning in Acts chapter 11, we continue to ask that same question, very simple question. What happened next? So after Peter went to Cornelius' house, after Peter preached the gospel, after the Gentile Cornelius and his family and friends that he had gathered at his house came to know the Lord in a personal way, what happened? And then we come down to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. So what I want to do is read uh, verses 19 through 26, and that gives you the essence, kind of the, the meat of the next event in the lives of the disciples. And, and just want to point out a couple of things for us this morning. So here's what Luke tells us. Luke's the writer, uh, right, of, of the book of Acts. So in Acts eleven nineteen, we're told this. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking, to the, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and men of Cyrene, they came to Antioch and they began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. 
The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he, meaning Barnabas, left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Well, as we think about this portion of Acts chapter 11, and think about what Luke is, is telling us, there, there, there are a couple of things this morning that just want us to look at as we think about this passage of scripture. But before we do that, I'm going to invite you to join me for another word of prayer. Would you pray with me? God, I am so grateful for your goodness. I am so grateful for your word. What a privilege, Father, to be able to study your word together. Thank you. And Lord, as we open it now, we ask you to open our ears and help us to hear what you would say. This we pray now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So what do we see in verses 19? I stopped at verse 26, but technically all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 30. What is it that we see here that caught Luke's attention? What is it that we see here that, that, that Luke felt like, man, I need to get this word out. I need to tell people about what's happening. Well, first and foremost, in verses 19 through 21, in those three verses, we just see a little snippet that helps us understand the work of spreading the gospel continues on. The work of spreading the gospel continues on. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look again with me at Acts 11, 19. So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. Now, let me just stop there for a second. Those that were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, wowzers, that takes us back several chapters. In fact, you, you've got to go all the way back to Acts chapter 7 and the first part of Acts chapter 8. In fact, why don't you? Because that Acts eleven nineteen picks up at that point. So in Acts chapter seven, Stephen, who was one of the original servants who had been called to wait on tables, Stephen has gone to an area, has preached. All of Acts chapter seven is a sermon of Stephen. And many of you may remember when you get to the end of Acts chapter seven and Stephen's moving to conclude his sermon. Man, people are convicted by what he said about Jesus. People were convicted about what he said about the resurrection. People were convicted about what he said about sin. And how did they respond when, when Stephen finished preaching? Well, they rushed him out of the city and they killed him. See, sometimes conviction has a weird effect on people. People can yield, or people can be stiff-necked and buck up against what God's trying to lead them to do. And this group was convicted, pierced in their heart about what they heard about Jesus. And their response was what? Well, we're going to do away with this dude. We don't have to hear this anymore. And they did. Took him out of the city, threw rocks on him, stoned him killed him and so chapter 8 begins right on the heels of that same event Saul Acts 8 1 says was in hearty agreement with putting him to death and on that day what day the day Stephen was stoned and killed on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles 
Now, by way of reminder, come down to verse 4, because I know we've already studied Acts 8 in our time together on Sunday mornings. What does verse 4 say? Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So, when we pick up in Acts 11 now, at verse 19, what Luke is doing for us is helping us to know why the events of Acts 9 and 10 and 11 up to this point are occurring. Other things are happening. And Luke's trying to help us get a perspective of what was continuing to happen while we're focused on the events of Acts 9, 10 and the first half of 11. Luke says, oh, other things were still going on. Those folks that were scattered after the death of Stephen, they're still ministering. They're still preaching about Jesus. They're still in other places telling people about the Lord. And so the work continues. How many of you have ever heard that before, that timeline from a chronological perspective that Acts 11 really picks up uh, where Acts 8 leaves off? Well, all your hands ought to be going up. I just said it for Pete's sake. You all heard it before. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of the timeline. The, the work continues. Even though we've been focused on Peter, and it, even though we've been focused on certain events, other events still are happening. And Luke, as a writer, says, man, I want you to know, even though we've been talking about Peter and what's been going on with him, ministry has continued. Those folks that were scattered are still preaching. Those folks that were scattered are till, still telling people about Jesus. Those folks that were scattered are still proclaiming good news. And that's part of how Acts eleven nineteen picks up. The work was continuing on. Now look at verse 21. Come now, I'm sorry, back to Acts 11. Acts 11, verse 21. These guys are preaching. They're sharing the gospel. They're sharing the good news. And verse 21 says, the hand of the Lord was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Man, what a testimony. God was with them, absolutely. And as a part of a testimony to God's presence and his power, folks turned to the Lord. Absolutely. Lives were being changed. God was at work. In those other places. And that's what we're told here as this section of Acts 11 opens up. Man, the work continues on. So what happened next? Well, picking up with verse 22 and going down through verse 30, we're introduced, or maybe I should say reintroduced, to somebody named Barnabas. Now, it's been a while since we've seen Barnabas in any chapter, uh, uh, in any story in the book of Acts. In fact, we'd have to go all the way back now to Acts chapter 4 to see Barnabas mentioned. But we were told about Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. A generous fellow. I mean, Barnabas was trying to help uh, with ministry in the life of the early church. He sold some property and donated the money to the church. And that's mentioned about him at the end of Acts chapter 4. And that's the first time we meet Barnabas. In fact, we're told in Acts chapter 4 that his very name, Barnabas, literally translated means son of encouragement. And so now you come to this portion of the book of Acts and you actually see his name and how it translates into action in his life. Because... In Acts chapter 11, from verses 22 through verse 30, we see that Barnabas does two things that are encouraging. In verses 22 through 24, he encourages the believers. And then in verses 25 through 30, he encourages somebody named Saul. He's an encourager. That must have been, I guess, his spiritual gift more than just a name. But his tendency, his desire, his practice was to encourage people. Some of you know people like that, don't you? They're just encouragers. The glass is never half empty. It's always half full. And it doesn't matter what you've done. They can, they can encourage you for whatever it is. You know people like that? 
Man, and you may be a person like that. And if that's the case, hallelujah. Because who of us doesn't need encouragement from time to time? Man, we all need it from time to time. Whether it's a, 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 a fist, in this day and age, a fist bump, a, an elbow this, or I don't know what you do with your foot anymore, a, a foot kick, or anyway, the, the ways we greet one another. Uh, maybe you get a card in the mail you're not expecting, uh, or an email, or you get a text out of the blue. Encouragement. Barnabas was an encourager. And so what we see in the, the, the rest of the verses of Acts chapter 11 is how he encouraged. So first, he encouraged the believers in general. How did he do that? Well, look again with me at verses 22 through 24. Acts 11, beginning in verse 22. So, the gospel's gone out to places like Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And people have been saved. In verse 22 says, when the news reached whom? Them. The news reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Now, what in the world's going on there? Well, part of what we understand and see in the book of Acts is this. When the gospel first was preached and proclaimed in new places, and word got back to the believers, the apostles in Jerusalem, part of what they wanted to make sure was that the right gospel was preached and that folks had come to know the Lord in a genuine capacity. And so they would send representatives. This is not the first time, by the way, in the book of Acts where this has happened. And so on this occasion, the, the apostles, the leaders in Jerusalem hear, oh man, people's lives have been changed in Antioch. Well, let's find out about that. And let's, go, let's, hear, let's hear about what's going on. So they think, who can we send to go to Antioch? And to go and, and check this out. And they send Barnabas. He's an encourager. Let's send Barnabas. And so they send Barnabas. And Barnabas arrives. And what are we told in verse 23? When he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he was skeptical. No, that's not what the Bible says. When he saw what had taken place, when he saw the lives that had been changed, when he saw the impact of the message about Jesus as good news, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. So when Barnabas went, when Barnabas saw the lives of the people, when he heard the gospel that was preached and when he saw the changes that had taken place in their lives, he was convinced, hey, God's done this. God's been here. The gospel has changed people's lives. And he got all excited. And he began to encourage them. He had seen God's hand. He had seen God's grace. By the way, what a good reminder. When somebody comes to know the Lord, you know we see a miracle, right? When somebody gets saved, that's a miracle. That somebody comes to know the Lord in a personal way and they're saved from their sin and forgiven. And they're given hope and eternity and a future. Man, that's something to get excited about. And so Barnabas, he encouraged them, started encouraging them. He saw the changes. He saw what was taking place. He recognized the grace of God was here. And he began to encourage them. And what was his encouragement? Stay true to the Lord. Stay true to the Lord. That's a good word for our day and age too, isn't it? In 2020, in the midst of all that, that we've, we've gone through this year, in the midst of, of a, 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 an election coming up, in the midst of everything that, that we faced, it's a good reminder to stay true to whom? The Lord. Stay true to the Lord. And that's what Barnabas' encouragement was for the new believers. Man, what a good word. Stay true to him. And that's what he shared. He encouraged the believers. But his encouragement didn't stop there. He went on now to try to find Paul. And picking up in verse 25 and following, that's what we see. He left, so he encouraged the believers. God's work continued there. 
And then in verse 25, he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And he found him. And he brought him back to Antioch. And Saul was in Antioch for how long? A year. BCA, Baptist College of Antioch. <laughs> Paul needed a little time to learn, to develop, to be around other believers, to be encouraged by somebody by the name of Barnabas before he began full-blown ministry. And so they spent a year in Antioch. They met with the church and they taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Barnabas was an encourager. He encouraged the church. He encouraged believers. But he also encouraged an individual by the name of Saul. I've had to ask myself a question this week. So who, who have I encouraged this past week? Who have I helped in their walk with the Lord? Yeah, it's pretty much the sound I heard in my office. <laughs> Just kind of silent. Sitting there thinking and, and, and trying to process. We all have different spiritual gifts. I get, I get that. I understand that. Some are encouragers. Uh, some have gifts of, 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 of other types. Man, we could go back to 1 Corinthians 12 and think about the, the list of gifts that the Apostle Paul makes for us there. And to think about how God has gifted us and, and in different ways. And so not everybody is an encourager. I get that. And so on those days, if I'm feeling bad and you're not an encourager, I'm not going to call you. I'm okay. I'm, I want to text an encourager and get a message from somebody that's going to say, hey, it's going to be all right. Hey, you can do this. Hey. And somebody that will encourage. But everybody's not an encourager. That's okay. Not supposed to be. Just like everybody's not called to preach, right? I mean, not supposed to be. Not everybody's called to sing. Not everybody is called to teach. But some people are. Not everybody is called to be a missionary. Now, I want to clarify when I say that. Not everybody is called, I recognize, to go overseas somewhere. But we are all called to be on mission. Hello? God's given us a mission field as a church, right? We're not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. And we have a mission field. And not only us as individuals, but us as a church, we have a mission field. And that takes us now as we move to end the, the, this message this morning back to Acts 1.8. What are we doing for our mission field? Our Jerusalem. Our Judea. Our Samaria. And even out to the ends of the earth. Well, part of what we see when we come to this portion of the book of Acts. and Acts chapter 11. Man, the work continues. Those folks that were scattered after persecution began, they continued to preach. And so we saw, read about a group, but way back in Acts chapter 8, they continued to preach wherever they were scattered, wherever they landed, wherever they went. And then we pick up now, three full, fully three chapters later, and we see that's still going on. That work still continues. Folks are still scattered, still preaching, and the gospel is still changing lives hallelujah for that and to think about the work of the early church well as we conclude our bible study time this morning we're reminded of a couple of things as we think about these verses at acts chapter 11 just reminded 
we're an encourager, to encourage. If we're givers, to, to, to give. If we're singers, sing. Teachers, teach. Whatever gift that God has given us. Prayers, pray. And thinking about the, the, the gifts that God has given us. Barnabas was an encourager. and He sought to use his gift in the life of the early church. God's given us gifts. Lord willing, we're seeking to know how to use our gifts in the lives of of the church today called Eastside baptizing church and to think about what it means that God has so worked in our lives and given us the opportunity no the privilege of serving him allowing us calling us to come alongside what he's doing to minister in the world in which we live. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we will conclude our Bible study time and then transition to a time of invitation. God, I'm so grateful. Lord, it really has been good to be here this morning. Thank you. God, thank you for the music. We've had the privilege of singing together. Thank you so much for the, the fellowship that we've enjoyed. And oh, Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for how it speaks to us and, and encourages us and challenges us to be about your business. And that's what these verses in Acts 11 remind us of. Now, Father, as we move to a time of invitation and as we think about how you're speaking to us, my prayer is the same as it was at the beginning of our Bible study time, that you would help us to be sensitive to what you're saying and to be obedient to what you're leading us to do. Well, Lord, we give this invitation time to you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we do transition to the invitation time, I know God speaks in different ways when his word is, is taught and open before us. And if God has spoken to you, we want to know about that because part of our desire is to do what? Help you to get from where you are to where God wants you to be. And so as God has spoken today, there's a decision that needs to be made. We invite you to help us know about that. And so at this time, we ask you to fill out one of those response sheets out on the table, out the doors there. And so that allows us to know what God has said to you. So we know how to pray for you and we know how to get with you to help you. So as we transition, as we sing, you do business with God. You don't have to come down front now. That's fine. But we still want you to listen to God's voice and be obedient to what he says. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them It's so, so good to see you today. Those of you here, thank you for being with us this morning. What a privilege to see you in the sanctuary. And again, if you're visiting with us this morning, what a treat. Thank you 
for coming to be with us. And we don't take that for granted. And we are so delighted that you chose to come and, and be with us today. Those of you on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us this morning for worship. And thank you for being with us on Facebook Live. And again, even guests on Facebook Live. What a privilege to have you join with us today. As Bill comes to give announcements, I, I don't do this often because I'm always afraid I'm, I'm going to miss names. But every now and then a, a hallmark like a, a certain birthday comes to somebody and you, you just have to say something. And I know uh, we've, uh, Mr. Bassford back there had a birthday not too long ago, a big birthday. Now, I won't tell you how old he is, but four score and five years ago. Uh, so anyway, if you've read any history. And our deacon chairman had a birthday yesterday. And he's a full 10 years younger than Mr. Bassford. Amen. So still a young person. And so we are grateful to the Lord for servants and grateful for longevity and grateful for examples that we have to, to follow. And so just uh, would you join me just with a hand clap of happy birthday for these guys. Now, I know we've got quite a few announcements, so please give attention to those. But I hope you have a great week, and what a treat to have you here this morning. Just very, uh, very quickly, we're going to have a drop-and-go baby shower today for Michaela Willis. The baby has been born. It was born during the pandemic time, but we're still going to have her a baby shower this afternoon from 2 to 4. So if you'd like to join us for that, we certainly appreciate that. It's going to be out in the foyer, just kind of a drop-and-go baby shower. Uh, OCC, I know this was mentioned earlier. But the OCC is going to have a packing party, Operation Christmas Child, tonight at 6 o'clock up in the hallway upstairs. They're going to pack 300 boxes to get them ready to go. Uh, I encourage you in the morning. Tomorrow is the day before election. And we just encourage you, if you feel led, to maybe come by the church and just have a time of prayer. Come in here. It's going to be quiet. Not going to be anybody in here. But just come in here and just have a time of prayer for the election and the country and the things that are going on. We'll be here from 8 to 4 tomorrow. So anytime you like to drop in, just feel free. Don't forget to vote Tuesday if you haven't already. And also remember that uh, Thanksgiving meal is coming up November 22nd. And we're doing things a little differently this year. If you would, kind of sign up so we'll sort of have a good idea of who's going to be here, how many we need to prepare for. In the past, it's just been everybody come, but with the, the pandemic and the things that are going on, we just kind of need to have an idea of who is going to be here. So there's a sign-up sheet on the welcome desk. If you just put your name and how many you're going to bring, we would certainly appreciate that. And don't forget, November 2nd, our business meeting. We've got a lot of things to discuss. We haven't had a business meeting since March. So you can imagine all the things that need to be discussed. We're going to be doing committee reports and all of this. So please make plans to be here. It's a Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, December the 2nd. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful this day, Father. Thank you for the things that you do for us. Thank you for the love that you have for us. Father, we could never ever thank you enough for your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we would take the message that we heard today to heart, Father. That we would learn from it and realize the things that we need to do, the things that you are calling. And we would be willing to go and to be used by you. Father, keep us safe this week and bring us back. In your name we pray. Amen.